Unconventional Soldier, a military podcast brought to you by two British Army veterans in association with ISAR.com. Thank you for downloading another episode from the Unconventional Soldier podcast, which aims to record the history of the British Army's STA patrols unit through the voices of the veterans who served in his ranks. Today we're talking to John Dennison, or JD, who was a troop commander and then returned as the battery commander just as the battery's phase of permanent presence in Afghanistan on Operation Herrick. We'll be talking about the deployments and the role of the SCA patrols on this enduring coalition operation. This will then mirror some of the challenges faced on Operation Telic, which we talked about with John Holden. And as mentioned, Telic was overshadowed by the Afghan campaign, but it's sometimes forgotten that the Operation Afghanistan stretched from 2001 to this year, 2021, And as normal, we will finish off with Des Island Dits, John's choice of book, film, and luxury item. And over to John. Thank you for joining us on this uh, podcast, JD. And we'll start off with your military journey. Well, Kevin Colin, uh, I'd just like to start by thanking you guys for inviting me to join you on this podcast. As Kevin said, detailing the Special Observer's involvement in Operation Herrick which was the UK's military name for the counterinsurgency campaign in Afghanistan. And I think it's worth kind of pausing to, to consider that 473 Battery had been in existence for 32 years by the time the UK ceased all combat operations in Afghanistan on the 27th of October 2014. And the Battery was fully engaged for nigh on eight years of that mission. And the organisation, therefore, effectively had been for a quarter of its existence had had personnel deployed in Afghanistan. And I think that speaks to the profound effect that the operation has had on the special observers. And I just hope that I'm going to be able to do justice to the contribution made by our people, both regular and reserve, during this episode of, of the Unconventional Soldier podcast. But uh, to answer your question, Kev, in terms of my kind of background uh, and how I came to be in, in 473 Battery, there's no particular um, military history within my family. It was back in 1994 when I was at Sixth Form College that I went for a a look at life day with the military, with my local infantry regiment at the time, which was the King's Regiment, because as you can tell from my broad scouse accent, I'm I'm a (laughs) scouser by background. Um, But it was kind of, uh, I was kind of conned in by this uh, recruiting officer who who told me at the end of this day that if I was interested to find out more about the army, I should fill out this whole ton of forms, which I subsequently did, and then found myself being sent a rail warrant through the post. Uh, which took me down to Westbury uh, in Wiltshire to attend what I didn't realise, but it was called the Regular Commissions Board. And I had no clue as a 17 and a half year old, but this was actually the selection to be an army officer. So I kind of arrived um, very fresh faced youngster uh, with literally no previous uh, cadet or, or any kind of background with the army and got thrown into this army officer selection process. Um, I was fortunate enough to come out the other end of it. Goodness knows how. Um, having secured a place at Sanders and also being awarded a, an army bursary uh, to sponsor me at university. So I accepted that, but really didn't know if I wanted to go straight to the army, if I wanted to go to university. And, and so with some uh, very good advice from my parents, I opted to have a gap year. Um, and on the other end of that, I decided, right, I was going to go for it, go through university, um, take the sponsorship and, and proceed to join the army afterwards. And really university is where I really got to understand um, really more about the army when I was part of the the officer training corps. And I was very actively engaged in that. It immediately made me realize that the army is what I wanted to do. And it was also coincidentally where I had my first interaction with with anyone from 473 Battery. And this was joining a a Royal Artillery uh, weekend event they laid on, which was called Exercise Brief Encounter, where effectively you were introduced to all the different capabilities in the Royal Regiment. And I can't remember who the individual was to this day, but he was running a survival stand. And he basically described how he'd forage food for free and he'd take uh, some mushrooms and he'd chop them up and he'd put them in the pot. And then he he had a chicken and he'd, he'd carve that up and he'd put it in the pot. And he'd get some herbs and in they go in the pot. And at the end of this whole piece, he's, he asked if there were any questions. And I put my hand up and asked, what happened if you didn't have a pot? And I was just met with this kind of death stare from this individual who uh, who basically just blanked me and, and moved on. But but what we did then see straight off the back of that was a, was a subsurface OP, um, which I'd never seen anything like it before. Completely concealed, fantastic arcs from the kind of aperture over a, a gun position that was set up just across the way from this forestry block. 
And, and that left that first kind of indelible mark on me of what this small clandestine but very squared away little organization was. So finished university, uh, having read for a degree in uh, international politics and strategic studies, which was a good kind of start point for the army. I uh, went through Sandhurst um, and at the midpoint of Sandhurst, you go for your kind of regiment or commissioning board interviews uh, where you're basically offered a place in, in the regiments, hopefully, that you run for. And I was offered a place in both um, the Gunners and also in the Parachute Regiment. And in my kind of last part of Sandhurst, it was quite a difficult decision to decide which way I should go. Um, initially, I thought I was going to go Power Reg, um, but then it was explained to me as I was kind of going through the process of, of firming that up that, I'd probably do about 18 months as a platoon commander and then be straight off to depot power or, uh, you know, an external posting. And, and what I wanted to do was just stay working with soldiers as long as I could. And the gunners were basically offering that on a plate. The other big influence on me at Sunders was my PTI, who was uh, a former member of the battery who had deployed on um, on the first Gulf War. And when he heard I was going to the gunners, he he just kind of impressed upon me that that's where I need to head to. So that helped me my mind up. Um and so off I went to uh, to join the Gunners. Um, my first posting was to uh, 7th Parachute Regiment Royal Horse Artillery, so 7th Power RHA, um, and that culminated in, in Telic 1, which was the, the 2003 invasion of Iraq, which was uh, as a gun position recce officer, which is what I was employed as, effectively moving ahead of the guns to uh, to literally cross the border from Kuwait into Iraq and, and proceed with the invasion. That, that was... Uh, an incredible experience and a, and a real culmination of, of that first tour for me. And then off the back of that, I um, I managed to secure a place at, at 473 Battery as a Troop Commander. Um, having been told when I was selected to go to 7th First Tour that I'd never get a look in at anything uh, kind of special after doing 7th, I'd be boosted off to a, a, a more conventional unit. Fortunately for me, there was a vacancy at the battery. And so up I went and um, I was there from 2004 to 2006. Um, completed the patrols course uh, at the front end of that. And uh, as I'm sure we'll discuss later, having done P Company and also done the patrols course, I could see the, the very clear difference in approach and requirement between serving with airborne forces and serving with the special observers. But it was towards the end of my time at the battery that uh, Afghanistan or Op Herrick uh, was really starting to gain momentum. Uh, and Op Herrick 4, which was going to be 16 Brigade, leading the break in battle to Helmand Province. Uh, very quickly, it was identified by CO7 that he didn't have enough foo parties as, as they were at the time uh, to reinforce the three power battle group as they were about to deploy to to theatre. So he knew CO5 regiment very well. I was already para trained, uh, forward observation officer trained, so knew how to call him fire. And so it was a very easy fit to, to draw me back down to seven. Uh, but the gift I was kind of given on parting was CO5 regiment basically telling me I could pretty much handpick my team of guys to the battery to go down to to join that that operational tour which was which was outstanding um and so i went back to seven so i i was now uh, an officer back in that unit but my team my five guys were all from the battery and uh we subsequently went off and deployed on herrick four and, and we were the first element of uh 473 battery to deploy to herrick and that would be the start of seven and a half years of almost continuous involvement with boots on the ground for our small unit in that in that theatre. John, obviously you, you're power trained and you turned up with uh, a team of guys that weren't power trained. How did that go down seventh? Was there any issues at that point? Yeah, so uh, as you'd expect, we were met with the, um, the usual reception that a bunch of quote unquote hats would receive uh, <laughs> when they were attached to that unit. But, but there were several things that really uh, helped us to bed in straight away. Uh, first and foremost, technically, we were on top of our game just as much as anyone else at seventh. Now, quite clearly, they were they were potentially ahead of us when it came to technical gunnery, but we very, very quickly closed that gap. And the other thing is that at the time, seven had foo parties, and then they had tactical air control parties. So one element that did surface-to-surface -surface fires and another element that did uh, to ground fires. What we'd already done in the battery was we already had integrated in all of our patrols, a JTAC or forward air controller, as it was called pre-Afghanistan. JTAC is a term we adopted from theater, I'd suggest. And we also had guys that could do the fires piece as well. So we were actually already the form product that Seven went on to produce with the rest of the contingent. So actually that gave us a head start. 
Secondly, we were all over our fizz, as you can imagine. So we could more than hold our own against any of our uh, born brethren. Um, and also, I remember very early on, we had a memorable training event in Friday Woods in Colchester, where we were to do dismounted contact drills. And uh, let's just put it this way, our six-man team were slick, quick, uh, and really set the pace for everyone to follow. Uh, so those things, uh, and also a, a training event I was asked to organise by the 2IC of seven, we all knew we were going to be operating in some pretty mountainous terrain um, in the kind of northern part of Helmand. So he tasked me to run a mountain training card for the uh, for all the teams that were going to deploy. And uh, myself and my uh, team 2IC, who uh, went on to be my BSM and, and, and later the BK, the battery, we decided we were going to take all these guys from 7RHA up to our stomping grounds in Gerlock Head. Uh, and it was actually very interesting as we uh, stood on the tops of some of those thousand meter peaks, soaked to the skin, feeling very much at home. And, and let's put it this way, the, the rest of the guys weren't. So I think a combination of all those things really, yeah. you know, drew a line in the sand. And, uh, you know, we were as much a part of the the TAC group as anyone else. So post uh, Afghanistan, I um, found myself posted to the Honorable Artillery Company as the adjutant. Um that was turning out to be just a very short eight month tour because I, I picked up promotion to major and it was decided that um, I should go to the, the first available, uh, if you like, major staff course. Um, very sadly, my first day there also coincided with the tragic loss of, of one of the HAC soldiers serving with 473 battery, um, more of which we'll talk on later. But also that was my first real interaction, a meaningful interaction with if you like, the reserve component of, of the special observer capability. Um, and the experience I had there and the guys I worked alongside very much forged my later views on how the regular and reserve elements of our very small capabilities should, should complement one another. And so, uh, just, I don't know if you're aware, John, but Kev and I are doing an episode in the HAC uh, in the next few weeks. So we'll cover a whole episode on the Honourable Artillery Company during that. Happy days. So. Um, after staff college, uh, I then found myself um, selected off off the course. Actually, I, I had a previous staff job lined up, um, but uh, it was decided because of where I was placed on the course that I was offered a, an opportunity to go and be um, a military assistant to the deputy commander of regional command south in Afghanistan. And this was effectively the high water mark of uh, the operations in in the southern part of the country. Some twenty seven thousand. Um, NATO personnel under command. The two-star commander of Regional Command South was to be uh, General Sonic Carter, who's now Chief of the Defence Staff, and his deputy commander was a uh, US Marine Corps one-star officer. It was decided that to help him, if you like, understand the nuances of the British way of doing business, that he should have a, a British MA. So I came off the back of my staff course, um, reported to 6th Division up in York, and then very quickly found myself bounced across the States, worked out the Pentagon where my boss was based at the time for four or five months, and then came back to UK for a quick bit of PDT before we then, sorry, pre-deployment training, before we then deployed to Kandahar from November 09 to December 2010. And that was, for lots of reasons, a, a real eye-opener, working at that kind of higher tr tactical lower operational level and just understanding how the whole uh, strategic campaign fitted together uh, or, or otherwise uh, during what was, as I said, the, the high watermark of troops um, in, in the southern part of Afghanistan. What was it like working for a, a US one star? US Marine Corps uh, being very different to US Army as well. As well, I've I think, experienced. yeah, I completely agree. There's there's a very, uh, well, there's a world of difference between big army and, and the Marine Corps. I mean, in terms of the parallels of the British Army, we, we are, if you like, a similar scale um, in terms of kind of mass to the Marine Corps. Clearly, they're about three times the number of the British Army. Um, but in terms of their outlook uh, and their ethos, I'd say there's more synergy and more overlap with the British Army, potentially. Um, yeah, working for um, this particular individual, he, he was a, an aviator by background. Mm. Uh, his, his call sign was was Razor because he uh, he cut people to shreds. <laughs> uh, it became quite a joke around the headquarters. I wonder if JD's been razored yet today. Because, uh, US US Marine Corps aviators are renowned for kind of eating their young, and uh, yeah, it, it was it was hard work trying to uh, trying to kind of keep pace 
with everything that was going on and keep him informed. Um, so, yeah, it, it was a challenging year in many ways, extremely rewarding and, and very revealing. But it, it was also the start of, of, of myself having a very long engagement with the Marine Corps as well, which still exists to this day in my, my current job. You know, I found with the US Marines, one thing they are different, though there are a lot of similarities, where they are different, there's no pussyfooting around. If you're crap at your job, you're told. Um, if you fail, you're sacked. Um, and I think that's a huge difference to the British Army. You know, you look at when Camp Basham was attacked, even though we were responsible for the defence, I think there were three quite senior American officers, including a US Marine, were sacked and removed from post within 24 hours. Yeah, yeah I, I saw that first hand several times. You know, integrity issues in the United States Marine Corps are an integrity issue. Uh, and actually, the, the first boss that I was supposed to be working for um, was called out on an integrity issue, reported to Commandant Marine Corps, and within 24 hours, busted from one star to full bird colonel and dishonorably discharged from the United States Marine Corps. Um, so I, I have nothing but kind of respect for the way that they enforce that that moral code of conduct, which clearly now the British Army is, I'd suggest, also getting after in, in a very, very meaningful way. Um, but yeah, the, the Marine Corps, interestingly enough as well, going back to some of the stuff in previous pods, the the artillery within the Marine Corps is is classed as being part of the combat arms, not a combat support arm. And what I've observed in, in my years of working with them is that if you're a gunner, okay, you're, you're not a grunt, you're a pogue, you're a person other than a grunt, but you are respected for being in the fight. And I think when, when I explain to the guys I now work with who are serving Marines in, in my current role about 473 and the fact that it sits within, within the artillery, they can't understand why, you know, that wouldn't mean that they're the very top of the tree. And they therefore are quite surprised that, you know, in, in some spaces in the British military, that because you're a combat support arm, you might not have the status of, of you, you know, your kind of combat peers. Um, so, yeah, that, that's an interesting difference as well. But uh, once that tour finished, um, after pretty much 13 months in theatre, I came back to the UK, was due about four months of, of uh, post-tour leave, um, found that I was being posted to uh, Fifth Regiment to Command 473, which was absolutely what I was aspiring to but after kind of four weeks of uh, cutting around at home got a little bit bored and was approached by CO 5th Regiment to see if I wanted to go out and basically do a project uh, a, a surveillance project surveillance base project in Task Force Helmet Headquarters so I after a month of being back I spent another three months in uh, Task Force Helmet during Herrick 13 doing that um, very compartmentalized study off the back of that, then, I was the BC of, of 473 from August 2011 to August 2014. Um, and in many ways, having been uh, or led the first team that the battery deployed to uh, Afghanistan, I was then there as we redeployed the final team um, from Herrick 18. So it very much felt, uh, you know, for me, quite fitting to kind of have opened and, and then closed that particular chapter. And then my final job before I left the Army, I was the executive officer of the Honourable Artillery Company, from August 14 to, to July 16. And uh, really that time is BC and then XO. I was involved in uh, in the kind of establishing the the Army 2020 vision for the Special Observers, which as we'll discuss later is the, uh, w was the kind of restructuring the Army post Afghanistan for future contingent operations. Great, so moving on to sort of the, the meat of the podcast now, we'll just give a very basic outline of, about Op Herrick and it's, Timely that we're recording this week's episode when we see the rush to the door led by the US that's happening almost 20 years to the day from 9-11, which was a catalyst for the invasion of the country. It's also interesting that the CDS, Nick Carter, who you mentioned earlier on, John, stated that the British Army were never defeated on the battlefield during this period. And that reminds me, I don't know, it may well be apocryphal, but uh, I remember reading years ago a, a tale of his American general visiting Vietnam and he was there and he got talking to a former NVA officer and he said the same thing to this NVA officer. You know, you never defeated us on the battlefield. And the NVA officer turned around and said, that may well be true, but it's also irrelevant. And it's absolutely true in Afghanistan today. So Op Herrick was a code name under which all British operations in the war in Afghanistan were conducted from 2002 to the end of combat operations in 2014. And it consisted of the British contribution to the NATO-led International Security Assistance Force, known as ISAF, and supported the American-led Operation Enduring Freedom. 
From 2003, Herrick increased in size and breadth to match ISAF's growing geographical intervention in Afghanistan. And Operation Herrick itself superseded two British efforts in Afghan. The first of these was Operation Veritas, which consisted of support to the war in Afghan in October 2001. And the last major action of this was a sweep in East Afghan by 1,700 Royal Marines during Operation Jakarta, and this ended in mid-2002. The second op was Operation Fingal, which involved leadership and a 2,000-strong contribution for a newly formed ISAF in Kabul after December 2001. Command was subsequently transferred to Turkey several months later, and the British contingent was scaled back to 300. Uh, but then all operations subsequent to that were conducted under Operation Herrick. In 2012, the UK Prime Minister, David Cameron, announced that 3,800 troops, almost half of the force serving in the Helmand, would be withdrawn during 2013, with numbers to fall to approximately 5,000. And then the UK ceased all combat operations in Afghanistan and withdrew the last of its combat troops on the 27th of October 2014. Between 2001 and 24th of July 2015, a total of 454 British military personnel died in operations in Afghan, with many more suffering life-changing injuries. And all of this sort of chipped away at the morale of the British people, especially when they're seeing the procession of coffins through Wooten Bassett. Slight change then at that in 2015, when uh, all training operations that were conducted for Afghan forces were, were um, held under the operation name of Toro. And I think really in summary, it's probably safe to say that we deployed in the Herrick with a degree of hubris backed up by a fal false confidence about experience gained in small wars during withdrawal from empire. A lot of people say the mission was never clear. You know, it changed from kick out the Taliban to stop poppy growing and, and even westernising a society that didn't even want it or even particularly care. And it's also evident that we initially scoffed at the capabilities of an enemy, considering them more a bunch of brave but enthusiastic amateurs. However, they were very clever and adaptable. And once they discovered they'd never win a gunfight, they quickly moved to the placement of lethal IEDs, which they deployed with cunning and skill. And it's probably fair to say they achieved the aim of fixing us and denying essential room to manoeuvre. And not only that, but the threat led to the adoption of increased protection for both vehicles and people, which countered an ability to move. And the old saying, firepower, protection, mobility, pick any two, certainly applied in this case, and we were just lumbering around the battle space. So, John, we often refer to the Taliban, and it's a catch-all name, really, because that could cover farmers who are disgruntled or had relatives killed, jihadists coming in from abroad. What did you think of them as fighters? And just for listeners who might not be aware, can you just give a brief overview of sort of weapons and kit they had? Yeah, sure. I think you're absolutely right, Colin, when you, you described that the, the Taliban were a very broad spectrum of fighters. You had kind of the core Taliban, if you like, who were your hardcore, full-time, if you like, professional fighters. You had the the other extreme, you kind of tend on a Taliban, which is how they were described in theatre, who would be exactly as you described, a farmer, a landowner, you know, very poor local people who would be paid what was a, a large sum of money, you know, around 10, 10 US dollars to pick up a weapon when they saw a coalition patrol and, and have a pop at them. Um, and then you also had your out of area foreign fighter element as well. Um, and then, of course, the blurred lines between tribal affiliations, uh, terrorist training groups that still existed along the, the border uh, and across the border in the Fatah as well, in uh, which is the region that borders um, eastern Afghanistan in, in Pakistan. There. So really, from my experience, Herrick 4, as you said there, the favoured tactic was to try and do more of what they'd done to the the Soviets during the Soviet-Afghan war. We were very quickly deployed into a whole number of very small, very uh, poorly defended, just because we had, we lacked the mass, poorly defended uh, patrol bases and, and forward operating bases. And at, at that point, because again, the Taliban had a large number of people, they had uh, very good resupply uh, runs coming in from, from cross-border in, in Pakistan. And we critically, like I said, didn't have the mass and we also didn't have the uh, the the air assets or the intelligence surveillance reconnaissance assets that could go in the sky to identify them, that we could effectively do preemptive strikes if we could identify or identify hostile intent. So you, you effectively had quite a conventional force on force match through kind of Herrick 4 and Herrick 5, where they would try time and again to effectively get themselves inside the wire of compounds with a view to overrunning them. Because the Taliban, of course, knew that 
that would not play well to a domestic audience in the UK, US, Canada, wherever else. And, and they came likely, close to it a few times, didn't they? They they absolutely did. Um, you know, there's, there's some pretty incredible stories that we'll all have read of, of of individuals who, you know, literally Gurkhas with cookeries drawn, jumping over a, a fence line to take guys on hand to hand to prevent them getting through a breach that a suicide bomb has created in a Hesco Bastion wire. Um, and the only thing that in those early tours really gave us the the upper hand was the joint fires overmatch that we brought. So because we had control of the skies, because we had those 105 mil light guns and, and and other coalition assets on on hand as well, we were effectively able to to keep them from the door. Um, but as you say, and 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 in terms of you know my views on them, I had nothing but respect for the uh, the way in which time and again they would get up and press forward with their assaults. Um, very clearly, tactically astute, um, and I think certainly on Herrick Four, no one in the three power battle group for a second underestimated the adversary. Um, there was a very clear respect for them and, and the way that they operated. But as as technology changed, as they recognised that they, you know, couldn't defeat us, if you like, in that that toe to toe slogging match, that's when you started to see the IEDs and uh, another technology move in, which was which was so. Uh, you know, crippling for for NATO forces, which is, which is what happened in Iraq, as well. Northern um, Ireland. Yeah, Northern <laughs> Ireland. Northern Ireland. So it happens in most. I mean, we, yeah. we always seem to face an insurgency that eventually technology. We rely on technology, and they are not confined by that, and they use their a new tactic, and we're continually trying to fight the tactic, and they and they're adapting quicker than we can bring technology into to counter it. Absolutely. And as, as Colin said as well, then your the political imperative gradually becomes not to take casualties, which means that force protection takes precedence over everything else, which means that risk tolerances are reduced, which means that you effectively can't take these guys on in the way that you need to take them on to to contain them. And, and I think a key thing when we kind of step back and, and look at this from the strategic level, uh, you know, Afghanistan as a campaign and, and the ISAF mission under the Americans early on was effectively a kill the terrorist campaign. It was try and basically end as many Taliban as possible. And with the advent of the McChrystal era, um, it was about separating the insurgent from the population. And it was about generating those kind of bubbles of security where normal life could happen and the Taliban couldn't get access to the civilian population. But the more you have to operate behind um, mine protected vehicles, and the more you have to be wearing body armor, helmets, and everything else to protect you and yourselves, your, your people, the less contact time you can have with that population to give them the reassurance they need. So it very much is a double-edged sword in terms of the effectiveness of what you're trying to do. From your initial deployment, are you able to outline the deployment of the battery from the, the BRF days through to the specialized enduring role? And then towards the end, when... Finally, the battery we were able to extract from the uh, the Opheric cycle. Yeah, of course, Kev. I, I think before I go in to do that, I, what I just first of all want to do is is just mention basically the, the, the names of those who fell while serving with the organisation, because it's obviously very important we remember that we lost three of our number during that campaign. And just to name them, they were Trooper Jack Sadler of the Honourable Artillery Company on Opheric 7, Corporal Daz Gardner of the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers, again attached to the battery for that operation. And later, Bombardier Sam Robinson, who was tragically killed on Operation Herrick 12. Uh, and again, last week was actually the 11th anniversary of, of Sam being killed. So three of our number who, who made the ultimate sacrifice. In addition, we had 10 people who were very seriously wounded through the course of, of the campaign. And what's very striking for me is that all of those who were physically able to redeploy after sustaining very serious injuries did so. And those who didn't uh, went on to basically find and attack new challenges. And all of them are an inspiration, but just to kind of single two of the guys out. First of all, we've got Lance Bumnier, James Simo Simpson, who on Op Herrick 11, was end up being a, a double amputee above the knee when he triggered an IED. I mean, his story is quite remarkable in that he fought through his initial rehab um, to the extent where he was able to fly to Cyprus to meet his team as they rotated out of theatre. 
Uh, and in so in so doing, as he said, and, and the rest of the team have done it, it, it helped them all massively just to have that point of being reunited, if you like, at that halfway house where they were all decompressing. I mean, Simo has gone on to do amazing things, but he's now the captain of Leeds Rhino wheelchair rugby league team. He's a member of the national team, and he was also an ambassador for the 2021 Rugby World Cup. Um, just just generally astounding. And then another individual that, that is noteworthy of mention as well is Lance Bomber here, Rob Long. He won up Herrick 12 in the same incident where we lost Sam, ended up being blinded in both eyes. Uh, and remarkably, very, very after that, was running the London Marathon. Uh, he then rediscovered as a, a former kickboxing enthusiast, he discovered uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, and he went on to compete in the Army BJJ Championships alongside sighted competitors and still absolutely whooped them, winning a gold medal uh, and, and also has won gold for GB at the Power World Championships. And, you know, both of those individuals and, and the other eight who, who we haven't named uh, really just exemplify that special observer spirit. And, and like I said, they are an inspiration to all of us. And I think it's it's also worth reflecting as well that it's not just physical wounds that a lot of our guys carry. You know, there are those mental and psychological scars that thousands of soldiers who serve with the British Army in Helmand, uh, you know, will also be carrying. And I think it's virtue of the, uh, the tempo that we were working to, which we'll talk more of later, that, that actually there was no time to kind of pause, reflect, um, process and deal with what had happened. And so a lot of our, if our brethren now are, are kind of, you know, still coping with this. And um, it's great to see that, you know, we have a very strong network around, you know, that, that looks after one another. Um, but yeah, th there's a lot, I guess what I'm saying, a lot of people who have, you know, suffered in various ways as a result of, of those prolonged years spent in Helmand province. Yeah, I think um, I think we discussed it earlier on just before we came on here, we were talking about these guys. And, and one thing we pointed out was that, that bland expression, a soldier was killed in the Helmand province today, doesn't sum up what you just talked about, JD, the fact that if there's one killed, there's normally three or four wounded, and then you've got the psychological scars as well. And I think that's that's worth bearing in mind. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, without without dwelling on it too much, I mean, obviously, um, Herrick 7, where we, we tragically lost two people, was, uh, was, a, was a real testing experience for everybody. But, but also on Herrick 12, when... Uh, when Sam was killed, I mean, you had effectively a, a captain, um, an outstanding leader, but a late entry captain, plus six guys who on the first time they deployed had one guy killed and two guys seriously wounded who had to be Kazovac, which included Rob. And that team that went down to one captain and three soldiers, and they pressed on through the rest of that tour, having seen what had happened in those early stages. And it's drilled into us as special observers that you just, you know, we lie hidden. We just get our heads down. We, we compartmentalize it and, and we move forward. And, um, and like I said, the guys did a fantastic job of doing it. But now what we're finding as a community is we are all now reaching out and supporting one another quite rightly to talk about and, and deal with, you know, a lot of what we're all now thinking, feeling and experiencing, which is, which is absolutely right and proper. Um, but moving beyond that, in terms of kind of, you know, headlines of, of, of what it was that the battery did. So effectively from March 2006 through to October 2013, which is just over seven and a half years, which spans Op Herrick 4 to Op Herrick 18, the battery supported by the Honorable Artillery Company were continually focused on operations in Helmand. That equates to 15 six-month tours from Herrick 4 to Herrick 18, and there was only three of those tours that we didn't deploy on. That was Herrick 5, Herrick 8, and Herrick 9. But even though we had not deployed on those, we were still preparing to deploy on them. And on top of that, we were also, as a very, very small subunit, running two surveillance and target acquisition patrols course per year, which, of course, is the critical lifeblood of, of the battery. And the so what is the, the tempo w was just ridiculous. And, and I mean, how many snapshot... people were in the battery? Sorry, John, to drop. Just so listeners might not know. I mean, you're probably what, you're talking about 60, 70 people in the battery this time. I, I mean, it, yeah, all up, including, you know, the, the, the G1 team, the G4 team. Yeah, you're probably looking at, yeah, 75 gusting 80. But in terms of, if you like, the badge patrol soldiers that we could put into these close combat roles, you know, you're probably looking around 55, 60. Um, and this was the thing, as I'll come on to talk about, that the pressure put on individuals uh, was immense to just keep cycling through this this uh, 
this really um, high tempo cycle. So, like I said, if you take a snapshot in time, quarter three of 2006, um, my team, which was the first to deploy, we, we were just recovering back to the UK. At the same time we were coming back from Hellman, we also had a troop who were just finishing off their preparations to deploy to Iraq on Optelic 9 to be part of the Brigade Surveillance Company. And at the same time, the remainder of the battery were conducting pre-deployment training with 12 Brigade to form the core of their Brigade Reconnaissance Force. And when you just pause and reflect on that, 80 people that are coming back from a theatre, going to another one or preparing to go back to Afghanistan, I mean, that tells you all you need to know, really. And for a lot of the time, you know, everything that we did as an organisation was literally one man deep. And on, we used to have a photo board in the BC's office with, with everyone's name and uh, photo on and then a, a kind of a record of what core qualifications they had, be they reconnaissance quals, joint fires quals that were, were the premium that we needed to find. And we would spend literally hours between BSMs, troop commanders, BK, uh, BSM, you know, everybody trying to figure out the optimum balance to just keep this this cycle going. And the, the British Army very much talked about a kind of rule of four or rule of five in terms of a, a kind of um, guidelines for, for tour harmony. And if you if you like, the rule refers to six month blocks. If you talk about a rule of four, a rule of four would be six months in theatre and effectively 18 months off before you're back in again. A rule of five would be six months on, two years off. But of course, your two years off isn't two years off. It's probably a year off, then courses, then pre-deployment training. And, and the rule of five is what most of the army, or uh, four to five is what most of the army achieved. Our average was was firmly a two to three. Um, and and again, you know, from from the team I took out of of the six of us, two people were back in um, Helmand within six months of returning to to Catterick, and the other three were back within twelve months. Um, and there are some guys in four seven three that ended up doing, you know, some of them five to six tours of of Helmand. And and these were not sit in Camp Bastion, sit in an ops room tours. These were dismounted, close combat, in the mix, in ID belts, uh, you know, close up and personal with the enemy. And and it's really, really staggering to to think about what everybody did. It's a miracle you didn't have more casualties when you lay it out like that, JD. I mean, Colin, I, I, I absolutely agree. And um you know, you used to send guys out the door, you'd, you'd package them into a, a very small force element. You'd send them off to the unit that they were going to go and support. And then you'd see them on the back end and, and constantly there's just that, that worrying concern, you know, are they going to be okay uh, in every way? And um, yeah, I, I totally agree. It's, it's, it's miraculous that we didn't have a, a much higher casualty rate. And thank goodness we didn't. But in terms of the roles that we we performed, I'd, I'd broadly say that there are four, and I'll, and I'll cover each of them in turn, but just to introduce them, there's the, the fire support team role, uh, which was effectively providing um, artillery observers and joint terminal attack controllers, so people who could call in artillery and, um, if you like, bombs and, and effects from, from planes, UAVs, or whatever else. That was the fire support team piece. And, and these guys were packaged into six man teams and allocated to support either maneuver companies or, or most often the brigade reconnaissance force, um, which was the, if you like, mobile strike element of Task Force Helmand. There was then also the brigade reconnaissance force. And if you like, we effectively had kind of two bites of the cherry on that one. We had Herrick 6, where we had a troop deployed in a dismounted reconnaissance role. Um, which also verged into uh, a, a close uh, infantry role as well. We'll talk about later. And then we also had the uh, the Op Herrick 7 um, Brigade Reconnaissance Force, which was vehicle mounted. Uh, and the headline for that is that, you know, the guys um, conducted the longest desert patrol since World War II. And we then also, uh, towards the latter stages of Op Herrick, starting on Herrick 12, we had something called the Theatre Surveillance Troop, which was a uh, discrete role that we performed and basically delivering um, covert technical surveillance in uh, some of the most active and, and, and dangerous parts of, of the area. Um, and then the other thing that, that I think is worth noting is that we also effectively performed dismounted close combat. Um, and I don't think there can be many special observers who deployed to Helmand 
that didn't at some point have to fix bayonets onto their rifles and prepare to close with and kill the enemy. Um, and for a unit that's covert by design and, and selects and trains its people to operate without being seen, that's a pretty fundamental shift in focus. And again, what's what's actually quite amusing is um, there's an image that was taken on Herrick 17 of, of one of our Lance Bombardiers who was attached to the BRF, who is engaging, um, stood um, with his weapon in the shoulder, uh, firing at a Taliban position at very close range. Now, that image has been captured and it's used extensively by the infantry. It's on the front of lots of their PAMs and documents. And I've, uh, I've taken a lot of uh, enjoyment from sending that over the years to infantry colleagues and making the point that I'm very pleased to see you've got a special observer as the poster boy of your dismount close combat doctrine. Um, but yeah, so it's all good on that side. John, can you send me that and I'll use it to publicize the pod if it's still out there? Yeah, I'll dig it out. I'll actually grab the uh, the screen grab of the relevant doctrine that it's on. Um, Excellent. It's it's a great fight, you know, guy with a with a UGL under his weapon, very uh, very good stable fire position, good sighting <laughs> relief, and uh, and he's given it big licks. But yeah, the infantry, when I've pointed it out, there's been quite a few silenced individuals as a result of that, which is quite. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd appreciate that photograph, mate. We'll get that on Instagram, get a bit of conversation going. Absolutely, I'll get that your way. So uh, w- what I'll do now is I'll just kind of single out each of those four areas and, and just talk about those in turn. Um, so starting off with the with the fire support team piece, uh, like I said, that was the first team that that I rolled out with um, on Herrick 4, supporting the three power battle group. The, the kind of key thing that we brought to the party, if you like, was not just the fire's um, skill set. It was also clearly the, the static uh, and the covert surveillance and reconnaissance skill set. For that reason, my team found ourselves working with the, the three power patrols platoon um, when we deployed out, and that became very much the norm. But but actually, uh, also saw the guys permanently attached to the, the brigade reconnaissance force as well. Uh, and towards the latter phases, um, the FSTs from the battery, like all FSTs, were coordinating fires and airborne intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance assets in support of strike ops, the, the full length of Helmand, and 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 did it very, very well. The the key thing, though, for me about the fire support team piece is that in many ways, what what the battery did for for an extended period of time was underwrite the Royal Artillery's close support commitment to infantry companies. So just to kind of put that into context, on Herrick 11, the battery deployed four six-man fire support teams in support of First RHA. And on Herrick 12, as well as doing the theatre surveillance troop, the battery also deployed another four FSTs in support of 4th Regiment Royal Artillery. And that was the same number that you'd basically get out of a full Royal Artillery close support, so artillery battery. And we were doing it again and again, back to back, like I say, out of a number that was probably about 55 to 60 special observers. And this wasn't just a case of go through PDT and deploy. We actually had to get the guys very often trained up first on the uh, courses at the Royal School of Artillery, or guys had to go and do their training with um, the joint FAC unit to get qualified as FACs. And we just, we had to keep passing these courses. Whereas in a whole gun regiment, if you had a, a bombardier or a, you know, a sergeant that couldn't get through one of those, you'd have another one that could take his place. We had to keep finding them. We had to keep generating them. And it, this is really something that for me is, is the BC was lost on the, on the hierarchy of the Royal Regiment. Because actually, it was the willingness of our people to soldier and to push themselves through these courses and, and through these pre-deployment training blocks that meant the Royal Regiment could provide what it had to provide to Task Force Helmand. I think it's worth pointing out as well that you're reeling off these courses there, but for people who haven't done them, they're very technical. They take a lot of intelligence. And then, you know, the, when you deploy in theatre, not you might be with an infantry company, so you're doing the infantry company stuff, trying to keep yourself alive, but also trying to deliver these munitions on target in the middle of a ditch, in the middle of nowhere. Huge amounts of pressure on you as well. I mean, absolutely. You know, fundamentally, not everybody has the aptitude to do it. And and what we were finding from our very, very small number of guys, yet yeah, some would find it easier than others, but they'd all get themselves through the course. They'd all then develop and, and work on their weaknesses through the pre-deployment. And by the time it came to the start line, and deploying out of Bastion to their areas of operations around Central Helmand, they would be delivering to exactly the same standard as guys who've been doing this for maybe 10, 12, 13 years. And, and that, again, is, is real testimony to the guys. 
Why was there a shortage of FST across the gunners? I think that's a very good question, Kev. I, I think, um, again, a lot of this, as uh, Conan is saying, it comes down to the, the standards required, quite rightly, by the Royal School of Artillery. You couldn't just go down past one of these courses and then and then get deployed into theatre. They're very, very testing. And it was also, I think, a lot of it a seniority piece as well, because, again, we, we generally in the battery have quite senior guys in terms of rank, so junior NCOs and senior NCOs, and they could go straight on to the OPAC, you know, level three or four course or straight down to uh, the FACs course. Whereas perhaps in some of the close support TAC groups, you didn't have, you know, that that correct balance and correct hierarchy to to kind of meet the basic prerequisites. And and I think what became very frustrating was towards the latter end, the kind of Herrick 17 and 18, we were still turning out or, or were being expected to turn out three FSTs on every turn of the handle. Um, and yet you'd have in some of these regiments a rear operations group which is the element of the regiment that doesn't deploy that would probably number about 120 to 150 personnel and of course our point is you're expecting us to still find guys and now what we were doing was sending guys back on the second third or fourth tour back into a very very kinetic environment and yet you're not finding that from with your own regimental uh, headspace and and this is a point i made to the commander of of one artillery brigade, first artillery brigade, when he visited that effectively without realizing it, the Royal Regiment has probably taken advantage here of of the will to soldier of regular reserve special observers. Um, and, and actually that brigade commander was instrumental in getting us disengaged from that FST commitment because towards the latter stages as the BC, I kind of could see what was coming in terms of Army 2020, this, this future reset to bring the army out of Afghanistan and get them ready for contingent operations worldwide. And I was very keen to to basically reset us as an organization back to our core role. And frankly, force generating for fire support teams again and again was distracting from what increasingly was becoming the main effort. So that was FSTs. Uh, on the, the BRF side, like I said, there was effectively two rotations for that. The battery originally started um, PDT to deploy on Herrick 6 with 12 Mech Brigade as their BRF. If you like, Herrick 4 with 16 Brigade had the Pathfinders, which is their, if you like, long-range depth reconnaissance force. You've got Surveillance Reconnaissance Squadron from 3 Commander Brigade that performed that on uh, Herrick 5. And so Herrick 6 was the first time you did not have a dedicated BRF. So Brigadier John Lorimer, as was at the time, uh, who's just now retired having been Defence Senior Advisor Middle East, as a three-star, he uh, he was keen to take the battery. The battery started to train up, uh, but when numbers became reduced for um, Herrick 6, the decision was made to just take a troop of the battery. And so that troop um, deployed and became initially a, a ground-holding element down in the south of uh, of Gom Seer. Uh, and I'll talk more about them in, in a little bit. Um, but the remainder went on to immediately recycle and become the the, the, the core of the BRF for 52 Brigade, who were to deploy on Herrick 7. And again, what the guys did on that tour was significant. Um, we spoke about it before, that longest desert patrol since World War II, um, reinforced by um, elements from the Yorks, Yorks as well. Um, but they went on to, to spend four months through Helm and Winter in some really savage conditions. As we said, they'd suffered two killed in action and, and five wounded in action, and they were involved in, um, in a, a large way, the liberation of um, Musakala, um, fighting patrols, raids where they would go each morning at first light in, fight the Taliban, push the Taliban back from the green zone, and then every night withdraw to the relative safety of the open desert. Um, and, and again, they were they were critical, like I say, in, in the retaking of, of Musakala. It was also on that tour as well that we had, uh, if, if you like, the, the kind of um, real typical STA patrol mission where the guys deployed uh, a an OP on a, a mountain overlooking the, the town of Nauzad, which at the time was dominated by a, um, a Taliban operations cell. Uh, the small element that was inside the forward operating base in the town was basically fixed in their location. So orders were given and, and the, the guys deployed and spent the best part of, of two and a half weeks up on a mountainside overlooking Nauzad and using long lens cameras um, and image transfer technology 
basically developed understanding and pattern of life of how that enemy force were operating and then got to a stage where they were allocated um, a pair of aircraft and they were then able to drop air delivered ordnance to destroy that Taliban team, uh, Taliban group, uh, and, and effectively free up um, the guys inside the town to, to move out and start to do their job. And, and that became a painting that now hands the battery lines, the NASA OP, and that that really, if you like, is, is your, your typical mission for uh, a special observer. So I think that's really significant. That is like the classic special observer task, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. And, um, you know, everything down to beyond line of sight communications, um, manipulating imagery to um, highlight positions, provide intelligence assessments, you know, that primary analysis function that special observers are optimized to do, they, they performed it on that on that tool. Um, and, and really, I think the legacy of the BRF tool, um, we as an organization uh, recruited very, very heavily off that. And what we ended up with through subsequent patrols course, I'd say through to the end of Op Herrick, was then people coming who, for the most part, thought that was the core role of 473 battery. They thought it was about kinetic operations. They thought it was about door kicking. They thought it was about, um, you know, WIMIX and being over and being in the fight. And of course, the essence, the unique selling point of, of what we are and what we do is not that. And so that meant that when Herrick, start to, to wind down, what we had to do was recalibrate everybody on on really what it is we exist to do and, and what we'd be required to do in the future. The next one is is the theatre surveillance troop. Like I said, that started on Herrick 12 um, in, in very tragic circumstances with the, with the loss of Sam and, and our, our two very um, seriously injured uh, other members who who had to withdraw and it left with with one one late entry captain and three soldiers uh, who who just did an absolutely incredible job of keeping that capability going in in Sangin basically in in literally the most kinetic part of uh, of Helmand and and the results of their efforts were showing Task Force Helmand and showing the strategic planners back in PGHQ and in Whitehall that this absolutely was a capability that was a game changer if it was used in the right way. And without going into uh, details, because obviously we can't for operational security reasons, but this gave a um, a remote eye in places you wouldn't normally have one, which meant that you could identify if you put this technology in the right place, the Taliban before they moved in to do attacks, and then you could preempt them. So you could literally then unlock the initiative and, and take the fight to the Taliban. And what this meant was it, from Herrick 13 onwards, we had a, a permanent establishment called the Theatre Surveillance Troop. And I think it's noteworthy that this actually nested very well within 5th Regiment wider at this point in time, because 5th Regiment through Herrick had become effectively a surveillance and target acquisition regiment. It wasn't a weapon locating regiment anymore, as perhaps traditionally it had been. It was now a fully fledged STA organisation. And the Theatre Surveillance Troop coming from 473, sat very well within that. There was a very clear synergy. And so probably for the first time in our history, we deployed an operations uh, as an extension of the the other batteries within 5th Regiment, aside from the Northern Islands and, and that we've already talked about in earlier pods. And we had a lot of really good success in that theatre surveillance street role. It's interesting, John, I just want to pick up one of the points you made before, and it's something Kevin and I have talked about previously and if you look across at Australia now and what happened there recently with their special air service regiment uh, whereby they were continuous operations and there was also talk there about recalibrating their role because they were you know traditionally they were using a reconnaissance type role surveillance and then they focused on door kicking operations throughout and Kevin and I have had a you know maybe a contentious point but what we've said in the past is there's nothing that those specialist units were doing that a well-trained infantry, infantry unit couldn't do. And I think the Australians are probably looking at recalibrating some of their units back to what they were prior mm -hmm. to Herrick. And I think in some cases with Herrick, the wrong lessons were learned. I don't know what your, what your thought on that is. Yeah, I, I think that's a very interesting case study, what happened with SASR and having some friends who, who were within that organisation. Same detail, as you say, that the tempo of what was forced upon them was just unreal. And that was purely a political decision because the Australian government decided they didn't want to commit line infantry 
to the to the close fight. They were happy to send their tier one special forces. But what that meant was that those guys were overworked and very, very quickly burned out. And of course, if you keep putting people into those positions, uh, you know, it is not going to be good for them. Let's put it that way in, in lots of ways. And, you know, th- there are some very, very good, clearly some very good infantry battalions in Australia who were chomping at the bit throughout. And some of them were deployed to Erzgan. But they basically got to sit there behind the wire or do the occasional patrol and do some some kind of advise and assist type stuff, not not get into the fight in the way that they should have been, I, I would suggest. So so I'd agree with that. And, and I think, like I say, as I'll come on to talk about the way that we were used towards the latter end and the real um, pressure that was put on the fire support team side just started to increasingly distract us from what we should be doing as special observers. And that's why it was so important for me as the BC at that point in time to get us extracted and to go through a reset of the of the capability. I think it's fair to say that throughout all the tours we've ever been on, we've had to re-roll and do stuff that we originally weren't trained for and then had to come back and relearn. We did it in Bosnia, we did it in Iraq, but we had to get back to those core skills because, like you say, you're only, you're only six months, eight, ten months, twelve months away from forgetting your basics and everyone thinks this is the new way of operating before you get back to a back to a, another operation or an exercise they go okay let's do the core skills and there's a lot of skill fade well you saw that with the infantry i was talking to friends of mine in the infantry and they're saying that they had a generation of soldiers that thought war fighting involved operating out a ford operating base they weren't used to living in the field and you know doing those type of operations launching from the field yeah, I'd absolutely agree with that. You know, it, it was the classic foblet mentality, wasn't it? That, that you know, that that's just how we rolled at that point in time. And and let's face it, it won't just be our small capability that felt this way. A lot of others would have as well. Um, but the, the last one that I'd mention, and, and perhaps it's overlooked, but but I did talk about it before, that dismounted close combat um, focus that, that everybody who cycled through uh, Hellman from the battery in whatever capacity had to adopt. And I think the exemplars of that were really the Herrick 6 um, troop that, as I said, deployed as part of that BRF with 12 Brigade. And, you know, they spent the majority of their time in, in the UK's most southerly FOB, which is FOB Delhi down in Garmsir. And that's effectively where the, the, Cal- the Taliban kind of rat lines that crossed into southern Afghanistan from, from Pakistan first kind of collided with NATO forces. And for basically four months, they, they held the line at that location. Um, and they were in, uh, you know, daily high intensity contact. I think it was one of the individuals kept a diary and he noted 95 separate contacts, all of which were an hour or more that happened through the course of those four months. And the guys did everything from mounting ambushes, conducting night attacks um, during their time down there. And then later, after a very short operational pause in Bastion, they found themselves with two mercy and again leading the way into the green zone in the upper Goresh Valley on, on offensive operations as a dismounted reconnaissance platoon. Um, they dealt with casualties, um, as all of our guys have with their enhanced medical training. That, that's, a, that's a core role uh, skill that played out through through Herrick as well and, and no doubt um, you know, saved countless lives. Uh, and, and it's also interesting that a lot of those guys that, that got to the end of that tour, which was so kinetic and so demanding, you know, the vast majority of them wanted to stay on to do Herrick 7 back to back with the BRF when they when they landed on. But of course, they had to go back and recycle and get ready for, for the next rotation. But but what I think it also speaks to is, is something that's been a thread throughout all the pods is, you know, the all arms nature of the guys that come and do the patrols course. Uh, and actually, a lot of our number are formerly infantry, recce, cavalry, remi, engineers, they bring with them a huge amount, you know, huge amounts of additional experience when they come and do do the course. As we've described, they can do a two-year attachment after they've badged, but a lot of them at the end of that time also choose to recap badge to the gunners and soldier on as, as an artillery soldier. So that tour, especially when the skill set that was demanded was dismounted infantry for the most part, they they stepped up, they pulled it out of the memory banks and and they did it and they did it in 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 really good form so um yeah i think like i say dismount close combat is, is very often overlooked but it's been a big part of what we've done in in helmand during this period john did you have to fight not only the the, the fights you have in the battle space but when you turn up 
you got Gunner Cat Badge. Was there a bit of scepticism initially for, for the teams when they turned up, when they're working with infantry, or were the reputation precede them? They're generally accepted. I'm just interested for a feel on how they were perceived when they turned up in these different areas. So I, I think it's very interesting because I, I think, frankly, that is a constant if you're a, if you're a special observer. No matter where you go, be it on Op Herrick, any other op or, or any training event, you are that Royal Regiment of Artillery guy who apparently does reconnaissance and fires. And every single time the guys have to assert themselves, they have to prove themselves. And, and as we know, you know, two of the underpinning tenets of, of mission command, which is the, the core of how we function, the British Army. You know, the, the two main tenets for me is, is trust and mutual understanding. And those two things can only be developed by operating alongside other people. And and what the guys in 473 and, and HAC, when they when they are deployed, get or have to do is, is establish that as quickly as they can every time they bolt into a, a supported unit. Um, so, yeah, Herrick was no different to any other theatre. You know, day one, who are you? What are you about? And it's only by doing your job and doing it as well as you can that that respect develops and then the trust and the mutual understanding flows from there so yeah i think that that's something that is is a is a well-known battle for anyone that has that latio triangle on their arm so john we spoke about the herrick we spoke about how to how we looked at disengagements so when you disengaged what was the challenges especially around equipment the profile the recruitment as well and how you reinforce the sta role not just for the not just for the unit, but obviously for wider, because everyone else had probably forgotten what we used to do. Yeah, so we've obviously defined what Herrick was about. It was very focused, and and if you like, it constrained what we were able to do. I, the, the whole time that I've been the BC, I, I was BC for three years, and for the first kind of, uh, I'd say, 18 to 20 months, we, we hadn't done a single core role exercise because everything was about the, uh, the the roles I've just outlined for, for Herrick. So I was very conscious that in order to um, get ahead of what you could see was coming with Army 2020, we, we, we all knew that the Army had been the supported component throughout the whole of the Herrick campaign. You know, the, the, the money, the funding, the equipment had gone to the Army. We knew that carrier strike was in the offing, uh, that the Navy was going to become the, you know, very prevalent in the future. And the Army would, would you know, not be in decline, uh, although obviously that, that, has, that has played out. Um, but, but the army was not going to be as prominent and therefore people would be looking for savings uh, as as the army would, would you know would have to re- reduce at some stage uh, and and the key challenge for me was that if you if you looked across what we had done in those latter stages it was all about fire support teams which is really what the the rest of the the close support regiments did so the key question is right well how are you different what is your new your unique selling point and so as, as soon as we could, the focus was to get the guys back, get a an air gap put in, and then just recalibrate onto core role, which is providing long range fine and finish. Um, and what we very quickly realized was when you started to see the arguments that developing army headquarters about, you know, when people looked at our capability, well, a, a gunner, any, any gunner can do fires. And the answer would be, well, you might find a fire support team guy that yes can deliver fires in a similar way, but he can't operate beyond the forward line of own troops. He can't operate in high risk battle space, and he's not trained to do the reconnaissance and surveillance that we are trained to do. And then you get the reconnaissance community that would turn and say, "Well, we can do the reconnaissance," and the answer would be, "Well, you can, but then you can't do the fires if if that's what's required." And so you very quickly you know, as you kind of converge those two circles, figured out where the sweet spot was. So what we had to do was get ourselves in a place where, okay, we had the really good, strong, well-established joint fires credentials. We had a, we kept the flame alive with the patrols course and and the, you know, the SOPs and TTPs. We taught the guys on that, but we had to really get us back into a space where we were an advanced force operating routinely for weeks on end, uh, you know, behind enemy lines, if you like. And, and the, the key to that was basically getting the guys through the right courses uh, and the right courses were uh, CA level C. So CA stands for survive, evade, resist and extract. And there's three different levels, level A, B and C. And level C is the level that if you are prone to capture and exploitation, i.e. your air crew or special forces operating at long range and a few other niche units, 
that's what gives you a go no go to operate at long range and we had not cycled guys through that course for probably about eight nine years at the point we were pulling out of herrick so getting guys back through that became a, a real push the next one was the advanced forces medical training because going hand in glove with um what do you do if uh things go wrong with the, with the csr behind enemy lines equally what do you do if you sustain a casualty and you have to sustain that casualty beyond the normal uh, medical chain that you know a, a close combat unit would have and so we were fighting to get ourselves involved in the advanced forces medical training that at that stage was still very um fluid but kind of running between surveillance reconnaissance squadron pathfinders and um some stuff as well with with ukSF and I'm delighted to say that since we started looking at this the battery's now got itself in a much better place again with its advanced forces medical qualifications and, and ultimately it was then about getting ourselves onto the right exercises um where we could showcase that this is what we could do um and so that's the other thing we started to do was to find those divisional level training events where we could convince effectively the divisional commander that yes he might have isr stacked up with aerial platforms he might have um mounted reconnaissance elements rolling around but what he needed was a persistent fixed eye of surveillance that could be in those battle spaces for prolonged periods not be compromised and give him battle winning information intelligence and so like i said when we were finally released from um the herrick commitment that's what we went after um and we did find that um there were some guys that perhaps didn't if you like I love the the fact in the modern day it's people identify with one thing and not with another and there was a f- a few guys that perhaps didn't identify with that as being uh you know the modus operandi of a special observer and so in in a few cases guys ended up stepping away um which was unfortunate but the contribution they'd made while they'd been with us was significant um we thanked them for what they did but what we did was basically just hone back in on those individuals um who were completely focused on on what it is we exist to do and i should also say as well that we did this in parallel with our reserve component uh, component sorry at the honorable artillery company because as we could see that we were probably going to get smaller under army 2020 the regular component which actually consisted of about six patrols simply couldn't do what it needed to do and meet all the commitments it had without a reserve element that it could could uh, reach into but for that reserve element to be credible it also had to revalidate itself in the same way that we had and so what you ended up with is the HAC went into army 2020 they went from being a complete patrol regiment to just having one sub units worth of patrols and what they then did the commanding officer decided to do was take the kind of troop that he had in each sub unit that was patrols and put it into a single squadron which is now one squadron HAC and what you ended up with was then 473 battery regular component and one squadron HAC reserve component and what we did was go out of our way to find ways to intelligently cross train so for example if the regulars were going on exercise for a week we would start it on a wednesday with the aim that it would culminate on a sunday and our reserve component could plug in over the weekend and okay they might not do as much time on the ground but again going back to trust and mutual understanding we would be shoulder to shoulder we also uh rescrub the patrols course and we did a for the most part a joint patrols course and the reserves started um doing test week to the same standard as the regular so they would be doing it at 4k per hour over exactly the same routes on exactly the same test week and that was a major step forward for i would suggest the reserve component and what it meant was that the guys have been catering new that the guys wearing the patrols triangle in one squadron were good to go and if you needed them they were there um, i think um as test me to the guys the quality of the guys you get through the hac because you know for kena for a guy who's doing that in his own time at weekends and he's have to train his own time they're showing a lot of determination to achieve that for sure it it was a it's a remarkable effort and um yeah you know when when you if you spend any time working in the reserve uh, which I obviously have and I know Kev you have as well um you know reservists have to balance professional life home life and the part-time professional military career and i have nothing but respect for people that are able to do that now of course we all joke around as regulars and we all like to talk about the fact that 
you know, these guys don't do as much time as we do. And that may be a fair comment, but at the same time, it's the quality of what's done, not necessarily the quantity I, I would observe. And um, frankly, like I said, there was no other way that we were going to be able to meet all of our commitments if we didn't have that reserve element. And to my knowledge, that's still continuing to this day, which which is great to see. But what we then had once we'd kind of, if you like, revalidated the, the regular reserve components, was we then had the, the piece about trying to make sure we had the right equipment um, and the right opportunities going forward. And the equipment piece was actually, as ever with the Army, trying to get equipment tables rebalanced takes a long time. But we were promised a lot of, of the, the right kit, which slowly started to trickle through. We ended up with Jackal as a patrol vehicle, which I have personal views that, you know, that's a very large optimum fire support vehicle in my view. It's not very static, it's not very covert, and it's not really optimized for surveillance. But that's what we ended up with. But we also managed to uh, identify that um, quad bikes would actually provide us with a good bit of uh, mobility, um, good bit of range, very easy to deploy in a cycle of darkness in the back of a Chinook to give you an increased range. And we started to trial um, quad patrols, basically, or the point where if you've got a six man team, the sixth man would be a, a quad operator with a trailer, put a silencer on the quad bike. Uh, and actually, you can carry quite a lot of kit and equipment, cache that quad very easily. Four guys can can literally pick it up and carry it if they need to, to, to stow it. Um, and and we found now, and, and to this day, it's, it's, it's now readily used across both sides of the capability. Um, and, and the initial idea came for the, the kind of sniper platoons in the, uh, some of the uh, infantry organizations that, that use it. And uh, that's worked out very well. So we got, we got the, the right people, we started to get the right equipment. And then, like I said, it was all about the, the right opportunities. And thinking back to uh, Tim's pod about long range desert group, it, I, there was something really striking there is hearing from a former BC talking about how he had vast sales experience having been BC of 473 battery. And, and I think that absolutely resonates, not, not just for someone that's been in the BC's chair, but actually for every individual who's ever been in 473 battery or the, the HAC, because constantly you are having to sell what you do. And, and actually, I think we are, we are pretty good at doing that. And so very much the job that I had at that stage was, was doing that for sensing, finding the opportunities. A lot of it came through 16 Air Assault Brigade because they, as we returned to contingency, were kind of on point for that. Um, and we actually found an ally at that point in time in the OCA Pathfinders, uh, who strongly made the case to Commander 16 Brigade that, you know, for, for early intervention expeditionary operations, he could basically facilitate the entry of the main force. What he couldn't do was facilitate entry of the main force and develop target sets um, in, in parallel. And he was the person who was actually saying he needed to have what we could bring from 473 as, as part of that wider Pathfinder I-Star group. Um, and whilst, you know, there would always be friction within Pathfinders with, with some personalities that didn't agree, the guys did some fantastic work with with Pathfinders. And I think one memorable story was uh, an early exercise where, again, it was um, an airborne task force exercise. And the guys deployed one of, one of our senior NCOs who would left the army but rejoined, was very, very old when he took this particular um, exercise on. He deployed through uh, horrific storms in northern Scotland, literally leading his team through kind of um, chest deep water and rivers to get to his OP position reported and, and effectively um, provide information that, that landed the main body in exactly the right place to to seize the objective that they had. And and he describes the end of the exercise kind of walking off the hill as the whole of three power in like a hollow square and just hearing Power Edge soldiers muttering, that's that special observer bunch, that's that Latio gang. And of course, for the guys to have that and for it to start to kind of resonate around 16 Brigade, that, that they were credible, you know, th that is mood music really for, for, for where we were at the time. And since then, the guys, you know, have gone from strength to strength, finding opportunity, seizing it and, and making yeah, the, the most of everything. I mean, we're hoping to have a, a podcast with the, the Servant BC shortly as well. So we're going to try and get the view today on how this is all moving forward. So we're going to now finish off with the usual Desert Island Dits, which is John's pick of favourite military book, film and luxury item. So John, enlighten us. What have you picked today? Okay, so uh, 
the book I've gone for is called Rise and Kill First by Ronan Bergman. And this is it's quite a large book. It's it's not the, the quickest of reads, but it's basically documenting the Israelis targeted assassination program from the very creation of the, the state of Israel through to the present day. Um, and of course, we all know anyone that served the uh, the strategic position that Israel is in and the number of threats um, as diverse and, and manifold as they are. Um, and it really just tells a very, very interesting uh, or charts a very interesting history of quite amateurish uh, individuals in the early days through to now what is arguably one of the world's most efficient uh, monitoring and um, targeting uh, apparatus. And it also very much, you can see how it's paved the way for a lot of what uh, Western intelligence uh, and Western, especially special force organizations do now in, in the, you know, the global war on terror and everything that rotates around that. So it's it's a fascinating read, which I really would recommend um, to anybody who, who has an interest in military history. When I uh, left the army, I worked for a company and there's a couple of Israeli guys who, uh, who are, were colleagues and, and now friends. I remember sort of 2007, 2008, we're watching the news and there's some some footage come up of Afghanistan and showing some rather hard pressed, desperate looking British soldiers fighting from a fob. And my mate, an Israeli mate said to me, why are your soldiers looking like that? And I said, what are you on about? And he went, they look very desperate and, uh, you know, really under pressure. And I went, well, and I explained the whole thing about the fobs and the ink spots and the platoon houses. And he just looked at me and went, why did you even do that in the first place? <laughs> yeah. Why why have you put people in places you cannot reinforce or you cannot resupply? And just puzzled. And I went, well, there's the biggest question going. <laughs> yeah. You guys would clearly have done it very differently. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's, um, you know, their, their, their whole approach, you know, if you, if you are in a nation state that is surrounded by other countries that want to wipe you off the face of the earth, you have to get pretty good pretty quickly at surveillance and, and targeting your enemies before they can target you. So, um, yeah, it's a very, very interesting read. Thanks, Mel. Look into that one. And film? So the film, uh, again, it's a bit of an old classic, but uh, Where Eagles Dare. Um, I can remember, I think I was about 13 with my uh, – my dad kind of sat down with me. This was obviously in the days of pre-video and everything else, but he, he sat down and he said, right, ITV today, this is a great film. Let's sit down and watch this. You're going to like it. And uh, I think it was, uh, yeah, I think because he'd recommended it, uh, we sat there together, we watched it, and, um, and and what a movie. Even today, you know, from the theme tune uh, <laughs> through to the cast, through to the action, you know, fights on cable cars, Clint Eastwood is a, is a ranger, you know, uh, it just it just has absolutely everything uh, that a good action packed military film should have. And I, I can watch that movie again and again. So uh, anyone that's not seen it, I'd be surprised if anyone's not seen it. But yeah, check it out or watch it again. Great. It's great got, and it's got the best comms line ever. Broadsword calling Danny boy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we've all said that down in military radio at some point. Let's face facts. We've all we've all thrown that out, haven't we, in that line. So, yeah, mate, great, great movie. And what's your luxury item then, John? Well, it, it it's not a luxury item per se, but um, for me, it would have to be a flint and steel. Because although a flint and steel isn't particularly luxury, uh, we all know that a fire is. And, and I have to say that in all my time, of, not that I've done a, many survival-related courses, but I am useless at lighting fires. <laughs> I, I, am, I am that person in the corner when everyone else has got a roaring bonfire who's still trying to blow on embers. So uh, for me, a flint and steel uh, would be a an absolute godsend, and uh, yeah, to have that fire going at the end of each day and, and keep going would be uh, would be my luxury. So flint not, and steel not, is not a lighter then. <laughs> no, Kev, old, old school, old school, Kev. What can I say? Very practical. Like, it's all run out of fuel, Kev, wasn't it? Ah, uh, good point, John. Yeah, yeah. yeah or you might break it. No, oh, here yeah, we go. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I support your, your flint and steel one, mate. So my choice this <laughs> week is um, Mountain Commandos at War in the Falklands, which is about the Royal Marines Mountain Arctic Warfare Carder during the, the 1982 conflict. I've always been an admirer of the sort of the quiet professionalism of the Royal Marines, and the Mountain Arctic Warfare Carder were no different. Uh, the author was OC of the unit, and his mission was to change the role from one perceives a climbing club to that of a recce force. And the timing of the Falklands was perfect, and the 35 men in the card performed admirably. 
It was actually the first time that 3 Commando Brigade had its own dedicated recce force. And in the foreword, Major General Julian Thompson, who commanded the brigade, wrote, The card has set standards of excellence in soldiering skills that were never bettered by anyone, including the SES and SBS. They performed their tasks without hubris of any kind that led others to near and sometimes actual disaster through ignoring advice or as a result of incompetence or second-rate soldiering. And it's interesting to see some of the politics in this book because Rod Boswell, the author, was particularly scathing about the SAS, saying that their inability to work with other forces was caused by a failure to participate in core activities without going off on their own. They also refused to give credibility to others with more knowledge and experience, which became their modus operandi and caused more problems than it solved. So some quite harsh criticism there. But I think what's interesting is after the Falklands, I think, Kev probably knows a bit more than this than me. Wasn't that when they sort of brought all the SF together under one umbrella organisation? It was after the Falklands. No, it was much much later than was that. It much later than that, much was later, it? Much later, yeah. Okay, I stand corrected there. But, I mean, there's a few quiet professionalism, surveillance. There's quite a few times with uh, 473 Battery here as well. And also, going back to what you were talking about earlier on the podcast, John, about direct action. Uh, there's a chapter here and there about the... Mountain Arctic Warfare card, the attacking Top Marlow House, which was where Argentinian SF were operating from. And their OPs around there were dominating the high ground and approach to Mount Kent and then joining features before Stanley. So it's a good demonstration of how a small body of men can influence the course of a campaign. I dare say, going back to what you said earlier, it's, it's the exact same thing. So um, there's also one last point is that there's a series called Behind the Lines on BBC iPlayer, which shows the early selection process from the MAW card, and it was shot about 83, 84. Mm. You can chase it up in uh, iPlayer. It's, it's a really good uh, watch. Yeah, Kev, when, your choice this Well, week? I was going to say, when I was in Norway, it was the MAW who took us through the Arctic survival training, and they were rigid. You know, the way they teach is really, really good, but there's nothing um, easy about them. They were very rigid with us all the way through. I think they've forgotten that we were a MAW, but there we go. <laughs> you have to be in that environment, don't you? They yes, are. they are. Absolutely. Uh, my book is um, slightly different from the ones. It's, a, it's called George Cross Heroes by Michael Ashcroft, or Lord Ashcroft, if you want. Um, this is about the award. And obviously, it's in the news this week because the NHS have been awarded um, George Cross. And there's only been three institutions uh, of site that have so far been awarded, which is obviously the island of Malta during the Second World War, the RUC prior to become PSNI, and now the NHS. And well, mate, my, my missus, as you know, Kev's a, a midwife. When I told her she could put GC after her name now, she was less impressed saying she wanted a pay rise. So she's, not, she's, not, she's not too enamoured with the George Cross bit. Well, we'll leave that then. <laughs> anyway, so including the three, there's been 411 wards of the George Cross since it's institutionalised in, in 1940. And that covers some of the awards that have been converted from living recipients in 1971. Um, prior to that, it was the Albert Edwards and Empire Gantry Awards. Um, the book itself concentrates on about 140, 150 um, vignettes of the individuals that received it. And as we know, it, it's, it, it's equivalent to the VC, but for action, not in the presence of the enemy. But still of note that over two thirds of the recipients are service personnel from the Second World War through to Afghanistan. Um, some fantastic stories, a lot of bomb disposal from the Second World War, the SOE people uh, who survived and, and some who didn't. Um, through to obviously the EOD teams in Afghanistan and some of the some, you know most horrendous sort of work and um, to clear routes. Uh, but what it also covers is a lot of civilians that have been awarded for running to fires, police officers, uh, air stewardess on board a burning plane, and it talks about obviously how many people received it posthumously as well. Um, in the same way the VC is, there's a, a lot of people who are awarded it after unfortunately they're killed. Um, it's only been, it was published in 2010. So since 2010, there's only been one further award, and that was for an action in 2013 by Dominic Trulon, who was a security consultant working in Kenya. We all might remember the uh, Westgate Mall. He was one of the people that kept going in, dragging people out, and he was awarded the George Cross in 2017. So it's as hard to receive the George Cross as it is to get the Victoria Cross. And I thought it was a really good read. So I recommend that this week. Hey, cheers, Kev. 
and John, thanks for coming on the podcast, mate. It's great to hear that account and uh, really brought home the diversity of skills and the dedication of the lads during that particularly demanding period. So also thanks to listener for your continued support and suggestions. And our email address is at the bottom of the show notes if you want to get in touch. You can find us on all the social media suspects, including Instagram and Facebook, YouTube. And please like, follow, share and subscribe if you're on these platforms. And if you've downloaded us from iTunes, we'd really appreciate a review. We're up to 55 now, all mostly five star, apart from the, the two star guy, Kev, that we still can't find out who he is, but we're on his tail. And finally, thanks again to Nick Beale for sponsoring this series and offering technical support for his company, ISA. And we'll see you next time on The Unconventional Soldier. Mm-hmm.